Elizabeth Evans and I'm a homeschooling mom of four young kids. I'm figuring this out as I go, but I'm here to talk to Bonnie, who has been writing and speaking on the subject for over a decade and has been homeschooling for three decades. My name's Bonnie Landry. I've got seven kids. They're ages 13 to 33. I've been homeschooling for 29 years. I'm a wife, a mom, a grandma, um, I'm a speaker and a writer, and I'm an advocate of joy. So uh, we're here to provide this podcast so that homeschooling can look like you imagined it to be. Hi, welcome to our podcast, Make Joy Normal. Uh, our, our main goal here is to help you uh, be awesome, to help you make homeschooling look like you always imagined it would look. And uh, our format we're going to use is that it, we're going to use a question and answer format. So Elizabeth is going to present her questions and your questions uh, to me for this podcast, and we will try and answer them the best we can uh, uh, weekly. So if you have questions that you'd like to um, present on the, have answered on this podcast, if you want to go to my Facebook page, Make Join Normal, you can submit them there as a blog post or you could, uh, sorry, as a, as a Facebook post or as a message, private message to me. So um, feel free to do that. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi. <laughs> so I thought that I would start with um, a question for people that have never heard of you. Um, okay. So what does it mean to make joy normal? Where, how did you come up with that? And what does that look like? Okay, well, for how I came up with it was several years ago, uh, I run a camp, a homeschool camp for um, Catholic homeschoolers. And so when you were at camp and, and uh, I can't remember what was happening, maybe there was some bickering going on or some, uh, you know, weird stuff going on and and i just said could everybody just please be normal right <laughs> and i thought oh wait a minute maybe we should just try and make joy normal like maybe norm that should just be the normal uh way in which we operate our lives and i thought really it kind of encapsulated for me what i've been trying to do all these years is to make joy a normal thing and not something we're constantly trying to seek and constantly finding elusive yeah. Right. So, uh, so that's kind of how make joy normal came to be. Awesome. <laughs> and so you were already homeschooling when you thought of this yeah. whole idea. Yeah. I mean, the idea of normalizing joy has really always been part of my life. Uh, and from the very early days of homeschooling, I was really, really clear that with in my own um, ideology that I wanted homeschooling to be something joyful, that education should be done in love and that we, sh we shouldn't be, uh, we sh it shouldn't stress us out, that we should find joy in all the little things and that education could just be another part of that, right? And that should it be done really important to me that's done non-coercively. Right. So that will be, you know, really all, all the subtext in what I'm talking about is, is how to, approach education without coercing our kids, without rewards and consequences, without, um, you know, all the boxes to check. That's my goal. Right. right. Yeah. That's, that's interesting to me. It's a struggle that I'm having because I have four, my oldest is eight and he's in kind of the second, third grade range. Um, and so trying to homeschool him and then his brother, my son's five and um, kind of trying to figure out a flow when we've got two other little ones that constantly need me. It's really hard to just kind of be joyful all the time, so to speak, yeah. Um, yeah. because there's just, it's a big hat to fill and to wear. And yeah. um, Well, and I think that, you know, to expect oneself to be joyful all the time isn't going to happen because mm -hmm. I fail every day. I, I fail still every day. Um, but if it is our goal, we're much more likely to reach it than if we just think, oh, forget the whole joy thing. I just got to get through the day. You know, we're much further ahead if we actually have ideals. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's very easy to get bogged down. And so that's something that we need to be constantly reminding ourselves is that I'm doing this out of love and it should look loving. And if it's not looking loving, what, what do I need to change in order to make this look how I want it to look, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. And homeschooling aside, even just as, as parents, right. How do I make this look how I want it to look? Yeah. So, and with you being joyful and that being kind of, I guess your passion, um, how do you kind of instill that, 
in your kids? Is it just leading by example? Is there, you know, words that you teach them, you know, to kind of help them to be joyful as often as possible as well? Right. I think mostly that's leading by modeling, right? Yeah. As, as is all the big things in parenting. That's the, the most effective means that we have at our disposal to, to teach our children anything is just by modeling, especially virtue, yeah. right? Um, you know, cheerfulness is, is really a virtue, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so if we are cheerful, our children are more likely to be cheerful. Uh, if we approach problems without, you know, throwing things and yelling and, uh, you know, acting as though the world is coming to an end, they're more likely to approach those problems um, in the same way. But of course, there's a big, big learning curve that's going to happen because a two-year-old, it is the end of the world if they can't have the cookie now, right? right? And they think they're going to die and, you know, they're, they're, you know, they might throw themselves on the ground or, you know, have a giant tantrum or, you know, break into a puddle of tears or, or whatever, however they're going to handle that. We need to give them the tools to handle that in some more appropriate way. It's not going to happen at two, but it is going to happen very gradually as they get older. We, you know, we know adults who handle disappointment um, poorly. Right. right? Right. And, and in what we would consider a childish way, you know, it's, it's, we have to cut adults that are experiencing that some slack, I think, because I think they've probably never, uh, a been allowed to feel disappointment. Maybe that's one possibility, but also it's possible that they simply have never been taught that, you know, what you're, the problem that you're experiencing, whatever that is, is, um, can be managed, can be handled, can be experienced uh, on a much less emotional level if you choose to do that, right? So, uh, you know, I think that, that we do that in many ways with our kids, one of them being simply um, waiting, you know, teaching them to wait, you know, and that's not going to come by saying, I told you to wait and I'm going to stick you in a corner until you stop crying because, you know, you didn't wait when I told you to wait. But in t into your tiny, tiny little kids, your one and a half year old or two year olds, you know, when they want something and they want it now, that we just make them wait a little bit, right? That actually, I'm just unloading the dishwasher. I'll get that for you in just a moment. That may end up in tears on the floor, right? But it, that's okay. You know, we don't need to get mad about their emotions. We don't, we don't need to respond that way. But if we just expect that that's probably how they're going to react, you know, yeah, I'll get you that cookie or I'll get you that slice of apple in just a couple minutes. I'm just going to finish unloading the dishwasher and then I will get you the thing. Puddle on the floor. That's okay. Oh, it's hard to wait, isn't it? And that's all. That's really all we need to say. We don't need to fix that problem. Mm -hmm. you know? And there's a, um, I'll, I'll talk a lot in my podcast, I'm sure, about, um, about, uh, a man named Gordon Neufeld, who's a psychologist and an advocate of attachment parenting. And uh, just, I learned so much from his work, his, he speaks and writes. Um, and he would say, what happens when we say no to a child, what happens when we sort of, in a sense, disappoint a child is that they build ego strength and they learn that they can handle things. Now, we don't give them undue pressure, right, right to, to handle those things. We give them age appropriate uh, challenges, right? You know, for a two-year-old, that might only be 30 seconds. That's an age-appropriate challenge to wait 30 seconds for something. Because, you know, usually if you say, oh, no, not right now, you know, the immediate thing that a, a two-year-old, a three-year-old, four-year-old is going to do is just, Meh! you know, <laughs> you know, that you need to wait. But if we don't challenge them inappropriately, if we challenge them appropriately for their age level and for what it, whatever it is they need, you know, we have to be realistic with ourselves too, that, okay, if we stopped and gave in to every small whim of the child. And most of us have, you know, I'd have common sense not to do that. Right. You know, we would never accomplish anything, right? And at the same time, you know, if I say, no, I got to get whole house clean, then I'll get you a snack. That's not reasonable. But if we say, right. you know, I'm just going to unload the dishwasher, then I'll get you a snack. Mm -hmm. The child, but the two-year-old, is probably going to feel like you're saying the same thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> In six hours, I will get you a snack, or in 30 seconds, I will get you a snack. You know, they are going to hear yeah. that the same way yeah. and react even the same way. But mm -hmm. what we know is by allowing them to do that, we're, we're helping them build 
strength as a human being, right? Right. They can, they can yeah. handle that. And they will find out they can handle it, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, what you described happened a couple times in my house today. <laughs> <laughs> Every day. That's life with little kids, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, that's yeah. just normal. And it's hard for us to adjust to the normalness of that. Right. You know? And some days it's a lot easier to, I guess, be prepared for those puddles on the floor. And other days it's just adding to the stress that, you know, it's just piling on more. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, that's the life of motherhood, right? When we just yeah. sort of live a constant burden of, of lack of sleep, first of all. Oh, yeah. Uh, a lack of alone time, mm -hmm. you know, a lack of adequate food, you know, you know yes. we're so, uh, you know, giving ourselves a beautiful thing that self sacrifice helps us grow in right. so, so many ways. And yet, you know, we're constantly dealing with other people's uh, emotions, other people's needs, you know, that's the life of, of the mother. And in, in that we become depleted, right? Right. But also motherhood, in a way we're dying unto ourselves, but yeah. we also have to learn to, you know, give ourselves life, whether that's, you know, finding outlets and hobbies and time away, because in, in that we're becoming better mothers mm -hmm. you know yeah. we give ourselves time absolutely yeah so it's a balance right yeah. what is you know what is a good balance between dying to self and taking care of self really right. you know, there's a lot of talk right now about self-care so yeah. and self-care is important right you know how does it balance with die to self yeah right and yeah. It, it can i really believe that it can and and i think that one of the answers of that lies in planning um time to self because i think as moms we often feel you know m you know mom guilt is is a real thing it's a real thing and we feel guilty asking for time for ourselves we feel guilty asking for um you know to be cared for in a sense yeah, yeah. and we have to find ways for years and years my husband and i had an agreement when i kind of got to that point i had i think i had my fourth child when i suddenly thought i i need to have a planned time every day every week to to know that i'm going to have a few hours to myself mm -hmm. and um because i'm i'm not being a nice mom and if i could plan it if we're always trying to steal it mm -hmm. you know or or grab it when we're desperate that's not a really effective means of of having it and so if we can plan it so we had every saturday morning i would take off for a couple of hours all by myself and i would do things like go grocery shopping it was just such a pleasant experience to grocery shop and not have to be thinking about the kids, you know, so that in and of itself, even though I'm doing it, something that serves my family, that in and of itself becomes a really pleasant experience. And then I would go out for coffee and read and, you know, spend a couple of hours alone. I've met other moms who really need a planned time every day, 20 minutes, half an hour every day. You know, we have to do a bit of self searching to figure out what it is for us and maybe even some trial and error, what it is for us that helps us feel cared for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and of course, to be heard by our spouse, to be heard is really important, you know, and to be able to express charitably what our needs are. But sometimes we have to kind of um, wander through where our stressors come from and what are our biggest stressors to know how they can be best met, right? You know, for some people that's gonna be, I need to go out for a run every day, you know, uh, when you get home from work, if I can just go for a run or have a hot bath or, you know, uh, enjoy some time with you or whatever, but often we need some alone time before we can even be present to our spouse, right? Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. But I'm a big advocate of planning that, having it planned so that you don't feel desperate when you're asking for it, right? right. Yeah. You know, this is what we do. This is our habit. Yeah. You know, and for moms that don't have, um, you know, sometimes husbands work away or they work really long hours. I mean, we're all trying to make ends meet and, and make life uh, functional, mm -hmm. you know, so we don't, we're not always presented or, you know, military husbands, right? We're not always presented with the same, uh, the same family dynamic. Uh, so sometimes if you can work something out with a friend too, you know, that if you take my kids for an afternoon, I'll take your kids for an afternoon. We're both kind of in the same boat and, um, you know, we'll, we'll make that sacrifice for each other because our family situation doesn't allow for that. Right. right. We yeah. actually used to do that with the frads, Matt and Cameron, they would watch our kids now you live too far <laughs> right yeah but they we'd get switch off holy hours so matt and cameron would go and we'd watch their kids and vice versa it was wonderful yeah it is and then you know get together for a glass of wine after or whatever yeah yeah 
you know, so I think that um, we need to sometimes be creative in how we approach that. But absolutely, um, you know, the find the balance, you know, early on, find the balance between diet to self and self care. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, let's let's bring it back to to homeschool because that's what this is about, right? <laughs> Although it's all one picture, right? It is, yeah, it's all one big picture. But yeah, right, sure. right. Um, so I'm wondering, what does a, a typical homeschool day look like? I know things come up, and but in your ideal day, what it, what does that look like? For you sure. Well, I'm going to I'm going to reach back to pre-COVID. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> and I'm in fact going to reach back a little a little further than that because of course my youngest is 13, almost 14 now, yeah. um, and then her, her next brother up, who's also still homeschooling, is about to graduate. So you know our life looks very different and very um, quiet you know, relative to what it used to be, because both of those kids really prefer to work in their rooms um, uh, on the stuff that they work on on their own. So uh, we still read together every day. We still have lunch together every day, um, like I did in the past. But maybe I'll take you back, you know, five or six years. So you sort of have a little better picture of, of what that actually looked like. So in my life, what happens is uh, we get up in the morning. Um, I usually have breakfast with my kids around nine and so that I can read to them. So that allows those who, you know, teenagers need to sleep in, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, but we usually sort of have a sit down time together. Now, maybe some kids have already eaten, but usually we sort of eat together, but the little ones who were up early might have needed a snack before then. We um, get together, we read together, we pray together, then we read together while we're eating breakfast. And then after we read together, we do a quick little tidy up. So I just, you know, I would just in the habit of handing out little jobs. Can you put the dishes on the counter? Can you push the chairs in? Can you sweep under the table? Can you wipe the table? Um, and then after that sort of time of reading, and that was a big variable, the time of reading together mm -hmm. might, it might be 10 minutes, it might be 45 minutes. And I was willing to just let it go as long as it could. Mm -hmm. um, and then after we sort of had a little cleanup time, then I would work, do, do my one-on-one -on -one work with the kids. So we had our family learning together over breakfast and lunch and our one-on-one -on -one time um, would happen after breakfast. So I would usually go for years and years and years, I would go youngest first. So I would sit down and do dictation and math or whatever other sit down sort of one-on-one -on -one work I was doing with that child. Um, and then I would move to the next child and do their one-on-one -on -one work. Um, and sort of go up the line that way mm -hmm. and then come back together. So we've usually done that by lunch. Um, the odd year that I wasn't very many years where I actually worked after lunch with kids, but it would almost always be high schoolers working mm -hmm. on them. Like maybe they were doing a study guide for science um, or uh, so, so essentially my job working one-on-one -on -one with the kids was done by lunchtime, but I might be helping a, a teenager with a study guide or helping write an essay or something like that um, after lunch. And often my teenagers might not need another hour or two after lunch to finish what they, you know, what they were accomplishing in their high school years. And also they would often work longer during the year. We would usually, I almost always wrap up at the end of May. Okay. And um, my high schoolers would sometimes have a couple of courses that would carry into June. So you, you would structure it based on, on, child not necessarily subject is that correct and so then the rest of the day sort of after lunch some of that might be given to high schoolers um, but a lot of it was given to the things that I needed to get done while I'm working with my kids I don't do housework right okay. and I mean I'm good at multitasking parents are good at multi moms are especially are good at multitasking but to me it was really important that I just know that's just not what's going to happen while I'm working with you because it's very easy to get frustrated Right. As soon as your child needs you for a math lesson, a math question, you come, you know, like, oh, I'm trying to load the dishwasher, you know. So just know that just didn't happen. I just would be available to them. Yeah. And then, so usually right after lunch, I would spend, you know, however long was necessary. I, t I like to break things up into little jobs. So spend 15 minutes on the laundry, spend 15 minutes cleaning the kitchen, you know, or, or whatever other jobs need doing. Um, so I might spend any, and of course, that with little kids, that's going to be filled with interruptions too, right? So maybe I devote an hour to housework, you know, including the interruptions, you know, of the day. <laughs> yeah. And then some time to being outside, some time to working in the garden, some time to you read to little ones or whatever it is you need to do, right? Yeah. So, yeah. 
Okay. So, or playing or having company, that's the afternoons were devoted to that. Nice. Yeah. Um, so my other question, because you are not the first homeschool mom that I've heard of to do reading during breakfast time. Right. <laughs> and I think that sounds lovely. I've heard like people drink tea and it's like this event every day, yeah. which is great. It but is. then I sit there and I think, how do you eat and read? <laughs> So I have never, ever, ever given a workshop uh, where somebody hasn't said, well, when do you? <laughs> so it's a great question. Obviously a question that's burning on people's mind. I think distractingly so. Right. Um, you know, so, so what do I do about that? Uh, it's a great question. So for me, what I do when I'm reading to my kids is drink coffee. Because of course it's easy to drink, you know, wine or coffee while you're, while yeah. you're talking. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so, but you know, I don't start drinking wine at, you know, nine in the morning. So, I, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe during uh, COVID time, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, um, so I always drink really good coffee, uh, while I'm reading to my kids. So that was something that I just thought, okay, this is just has to, this has to be meaningful and special to me. Mm -hmm. Um, if my kids wanted me to read longer when they were younger, they would say, can I massage your back? And then you could keep reading. <laughs> so yeah. And, um, so basically I would either eat when I, so I don't, I'm not a big eater. Okay. I often don't eat till 11 or 12 or whatever. That's okay. except when I was pregnant where I would just eat all day long. Right? right. And so if I was pregnant, I would get up in the morning at whatever, six or seven, whenever the first kids got up and I would have a meal then, and then have a meal before I started reading to the kids. And um, then I would have a uh, meal probably after I read to them as well. So I would gen, what I would do is eat either before then or after I read to my kids and then have my coffee while I'm sitting reading to them. Okay. It doesn't work some people because they need the coffee to wake up. I'm usually all, almost always awake for two right. hours yeah. before I have the coffee. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, no, yeah I, so. I've always wondered that because it's I know. we love to read aloud in our family. And you know, I perhaps it work over a meal. Yeah. 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 The other thing too is that it's not essential over the meal. It's just that they're already gathered. Yeah. So you're capitalizing on kind of them already being gathered, right? Right. Um, and so and kids love to eat. So you know <laughs> that's yeah. helpful. But, you know, you could do that on the couch as well. You could read, you have breakfast together and then read on the couch, you know, if you've structured your, your time that way. I just yeah. find it real, I found it really efficient, I still find it efficient to, to read that way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, sort of depending on what your, your family is able to do kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm a very kind of black and white person. I like when I hear a schedule or a routine from other homeschooling moms that I'd like to adopt, I... I try it almost like perfectly and it almost right. never works out that way because our family is different than, you know, some other family. Yeah. Right. right. I think the, you, you just said the word there um, that I think is the most important thing is routine over schedule guaranteed. If you schedule, okay, tomorrow morning, we're going to start at eight 30 guaranteed. Somebody's going to throw up at, you know, eight 25, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the way family life runs. Yeah. But if you build routine and method, you know, so that uh, what we do is when everybody's ready and you have a, you know, I mean, I have a rough time frame when I want that to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, when everybody's ready, we're going to sit down and have breakfast. We're going to say our prayers, have breakfast and read um, as opposed to trying to make that happen at a certain time. Because if, it, if you schedule it for nine and it's nine oh five, you already feel like a failure. Right. right? Yeah. Where if it's a routine, we do this, then we do this, then we do this, then we do this. It doesn't feel like failure. Right. It feels right. like, okay, we're, we're, fulfilling our routine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's some good stuff. Okay. <laughs> so for, for moms um, and dads who have decided, okay, I'm, I'm I want to homeschool. We're going to, we're going to do this. Um, what advice do you have for curriculum? Where, where do they look to, to pull, you know, what they're going to use where, I mean, I grew up, teachers would do lesson plans. My parents didn't have to worry about anything. Yeah. But, for homeschooling, moms have to figure it out. So. Yeah, I would say, to be perfectly honest, you will save yourself so much money uh, by not jumping into curriculum, okay? Uh, one of the things that, the uh, one of the books that affected me, it's a little set of books, now it comes as one book, was called The Three R's by Ruth Beechick. Um, Beechick is B-E-E-C-H-I-K. We can pop that in the show notes to a link to that. Mm -hmm. uh, Ruth Beechick was an um, author to me in my mind way before her time. She taught about teaching 
reading, language, and math um, in a very, very simple, natural, she called it the natural inductive approach. So you don't really need anything. In what ways can we teach with, with just what we have presented to us? Yeah. Uh, and I learned so much from reading those books and, and I was so grateful that I read them because I just never purchased curriculum off the bat. So the first several years, probably, I'm going to say 10 years of, or eight years of, of the homeschooling, I never bought any curriculum at all. And that only really comes into our life until when the kids are in high school, yeah. right? No, not that I would bring in math curriculum a little earlier than that, like maybe around grade first, my first child, it was grade seven, I started with an actual curriculum for math. Okay. And that sort of depended on the child when okay. I would do that. So Ruth, Ruth Beechick, The Three R's, um, my little books, Homeschooling Simplified series. So I have, um, you know, a book on writing, a book on dictation, a book on math, um, a book on how to read a book. Uh, what's the other one? <laughs> Chocolate chip math. What did I say? Oh, hold on, I'm gonna grab them. So, writing, reading, chocolate chip math, dictation, and the other one is called What Matters Most, which is a book about uh, relationship, really, um, that I, I am capitalizing on all the best that I learned from Ruth Beechick and then brought it into, um, you know, how, how it, that all played out in our family life and sort of tried to expand on, on that idea, yeah. particularly in the book Dictation, which I, I found out about dictation through Ruth, Ruth Beechick's books, uh, but I altered it for our family and I feel made it more accessible to most parents and more uh, child friendly, I think. Um, the, the premise of my books is that how can we do this in, a, in the most natural way possible and how can we do it keeping the relationship intact? That's the main um, thing we're trying to achieve here. And so if you read my books or her books or both or all those books, she really brings to light how, um, how we can do this without buying curriculum for the first several years of homeschooling. So that's where I would point people because I think that if you can get your feet wet without curriculum, mm -hmm. you'll be much better prepared to actually know what it is you like out of a curriculum. Right. right? Yeah. And then when you're reading it and it talks about how a child learns and what level it's at and how you approach the day and how you schedule, you'll already understand what works for your family. You'll have a pretty good grip on that. Right. Then, okay, I can choose this science curriculum or this packaged curriculum or this math curriculum because I think that will work better for my family. Right. right? Yeah. So I, I'm, I would lean towards non-curriculum for sure. Yeah. yeah. And I think um, when you said, you know, spending so much money on curriculums, yeah. um, we, I, I think I was tempted to do that. We had, my oldest um, is, you know, second grade math, and but we were thinking, should we switch math curriculums? And so I was looking into different curriculums, but to start those, you need all these manipulatives, which are yeah. hundreds of dollars. Yeah. And it's basically saying you, if you don't have these manipulatives, you can't teach it effectively. And, and I'm thinking, I don't have that kind of money to try all these different curriculums to see what yeah. works and doesn't. Cause my five-year-old who's getting started with reading, we tried the 100 easy lessons to read. Right. Yeah. And that didn't really work for him. And so yeah. instead I got the Oh, I forget what it's called, but it's literally a phonics book. And we're just going over different phonics sounds and he's reading the words that associate with that. And he's reading Bob books and, you know, sounding out words in the middle of the page of the big books we read him, you know? And so uh, he's thriving uh, with that, but. Yeah. Depending know. on the kid, right. You know, yeah. depending on the kid. And so the more you sort of, uh, approach, um, homeschooling and education in sort of this very natural, you know, inductive way where we, we present information to it, we let them absorb it, we, we, we feed them, we feed them, and we, we are sensitive to when they are being challenged, we're sensitive to when uh, to challenge them, right, in a, in a really natural way, then uh, we're, we're much more likely to know what curriculum is going to work best for them, you know, as they get a little older, right? Yeah, but it's a classic story. What you're talking, what you're describing. Yeah. So many parents, you know, I've just heard that from so many parents that they they buy a curriculum, they use it for a year or two, and they think, okay, this is not working for my family, right. right? Buy a new curriculum, use it for a year or two, you know, and and you know, 
I've heard people make reference to sort of, you know, the half dozen curriculums that are sitting on their basement shelves because, you know, yeah. they, they don't want to, they think, oh, maybe, maybe, you know, it'll work in the future or maybe it'll work for that kid or this kid or whatever. But really, do you want a different curriculum for each child? You know, that's, right. that's not very time efficient either. Right. Right. So, um, yeah. So yeah, classic story for sure. Yeah. My five-year-old and my eight-year-old are actually doing second grade math together. So yeah. You know, and, and it's just because my five-year-old loves math and he wants to learn it. And so he gets yeah. to do it with his big brother. But I also am reminding myself constantly that he is only five. If he doesn't get that, this, it's okay. I think this is one of the major differences between homeschooling and classroom teaching is that we're very intimately involved in their lives. And mm -hmm. so we know what they know. Right. You know, and so it's easy then to challenge them just a little bit more. Could I, you know introduce this idea? Could I, you know, introduce a, a concept to them? You know, I think they're probably ready for that. And if, you know, they wig out all of a sudden, then you think, okay, we're going to have to break that down a little bit because there's obviously this was a little too much for them, you know? Right. So one of the, um, of, of my books, the first one I wrote was, is the book called Homeschooling Simplified Dictation. And that's really what, it was so foundational for me because the idea of dictation was so foundational because, uh, it's where I learned to really become kind of in an intimate learning environment with my child mm -hmm. and to understand what it was that, uh, how I could bring them along, right? Yeah. And so if if I was going to suggest to somebody, I've got a lot of blog posts on dictation and I'll be putting up some more um, older blog posts on my new website um, on dictation because I think it's just so foundational to tuning into our kid and what they know and how to challenge them. But that's basically all of our teaching is kind of based on the same premise is that I'm going to present information with you. I'm going to walk beside you. Mm -hmm. And when I see you grabbing it, then I'm just going to let you grab it. And then once I see you've grabbed it, I'm, then I might once in a while say, oh, hey, do you remember how to do such and such? You know, do you remember how to use quotation marks? Or yeah. say something like somebody's speaking now. Mm -hmm. And they might say, oh, I'll put my quotation marks in. But they might also say, huh? What is it? You know, what does that matter? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, as a way of indicating that, do you remember when we learned about quotation marks, right? We have to remind them, but eventually you won't have to remind them anymore. Yeah. So they're going to grab it. They're, you, you introduce it, you explore it, you repeat it. Eventually they grab it, you know, and that might take one time and it might take a hundred times, but eventually they'll grab it. Yeah. You know? And so it was just, that was, I think a really foundational idea. So I would encourage people to kind of look at that if you, if this is a new, even if you've been homeschooling for a while, step back a little bit. If you're frustrated with the way things are going, if you're not frustrated, don't try and change it. <laughs> yeah. If you're frustrated with the way things are going, try to sort of get a picture of what that sort of relational type of learning looks like, you know? Yeah. yeah. So then that leads me to wondering, I think I've heard of a lot of homeschooling families having this fear of the big phone, the big arrival at the door of CPS. Um, right. <laughs> how, I mean, it's, it's a huge fear. My neighbors all know we homeschool, so I'm, I'm not as nervous now, but you know, how, if somebody comes knocking on your door, what do you have to offer to show right. my kids know this? Because you know, I, I think about kids who aren't good test takers yeah. and they have trouble, you know, on the spot. I, I mean, I don't know how it works if somebody were to come. How, how do you kind of, I guess, prove? You know, my kids are learning. It's not a traditional school environment, but, right. you know. That's no, a great question. Really good question. Um, I have always believed it's really important to keep records. Mm -hmm. um, I think that records can be... Um, uh, very simple right and I think that when we keep records for our kids we should be aware of of kind of across the subject areas that would be normal to kids study um, that you should just sort of be jotting things down in fact if you want I can actually put this in the show notes I'll, I'll write it down I've got like a little template that I shared on my um, Facebook page of what I used to do when I had a house full of little kids and it was just the, the easiest, of course, now I have more time to devote to record keeping. I'm still not, you know, I don't keep extensive records. I just jot down what we do, but the template is 
kind of has a little box for every subject. Mm -hmm. And so that I could literally put a one word thing in there, language arts, then I could just, and I, it was a weekly template. So I could just write dictation or this poem or that poem or whatever we were doing for dictation. Okay. Um, or if I talked about words, I could just jot down, you know, oh, we, we talked about uh, rhyming words or we talked about uh, whatever. I just jot it down as a one word answer, rhyming, um, you know, uh, maybe endings, ING ending, what does it mean? Right. I could just jot down ing or or if we were studying science or social studies or math that I could just pop in these little one word things and at the end of the week I had a beautiful looking template with just little one word um, bullet points of, of what we actually did all week right okay. now with iPhones of course you know just click 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 but my kids I didn't produce a lot with my kids but we talked a lot about things yeah you know and so the iPhone's great for things you produce but you know, when you're discussing things, you need to jot that down, right? And so you have, oh, here's our weekly plan. Somebody came to your door, here's our weekly plan. I think it's also a good idea to have a very um, loose outline of what it is you want to accomplish this year. I don't do that for me, right? Whether we stick to the outline even or not is, is irrelevant to me because I like seeing where kids take things. But if I have an outline, so I write down each kid's name, on a, on a list, you know, um, and I'll put like uh, math, we're doing X, um, you know, language, we're doing X, reading, we're doing X. And I, I just sort of have, again, bullet points for each kid at the beginning of the year. At the end of the year, I take that out and I might just make some notes on the other side of the paper mm -hmm. saying, um, learn to read uh, um, fluently. Um, can add up to 10 fluently, can, you know, whatever, I might just make some notes. So there's a one sheet of paper that kind of has my year plan and the, the uh, where we're at at the end of the year, right? And it may relate to the outline in the beginning or not. <laughs> yeah.